Hello and good evening students and welcome to Baidu's exam prep IS. Now before we start our daily quiz, here is a very quick and important announcement for all of you that we are having a free workshop on UPSC CSE 2024 regarding the syllabus, the books that will be required for your preparation and the overall strategy that you must adopt to crack this particular exam. So this workshop will be exclusively available on the Baiju's exam prep app on 15th April from 6 p.m. onwards. So do not forget to download the app and register for this workshop. The registration link is available in the video description. Let us now move to the first question. Identify the correct statements. India ranks fourth globally with regards to installed solar power capacity. Solar Energy Corporation of India is a PSU, public sector unit of the Ministry of New and Renewable Energy. India has achieved its 2015 INDC, Intended Nationally Determined Contributions, of generating 40% of the total installed power from non-fossil fuel sources. We have taken this question because the Solar Energy Corporation of India, which actually is a central sector, public sector enterprise or public sector unit under the Ministry of New and Renewable Energy, it has now received a Mini Ratna Category 1 status. Now, what is this status exactly? Any central sector PSE or PSU which has made profits in the last three years continuously and its pre-tax profit is rupees 30 crore or more in at least one of these three years and apart from that it has a positive net worth then that cpse it can get this mini ratna category one status apart from that the indian government has mini ratna category two status we also have the Navratna and the Maharatna categories. Now, when it comes to renewable power in India, the year-end report of the Ministry of New and Renewable Energy, India stood fourth globally when it came to renewable energy installed capacity and we were fourth in wind power as well as solar power capacities. Now, our generation from non-fossil fuel sources at the end of year 2022 was 42.2 six percent of the total installed generation capacity in october 2015 india submitted its list of indcs now one of the target under that was to obtain the generation from non-fossil fuel sources to 40 percent of the total installed generation capacity in the country we have already achieved this target and that is why in august 2022 this target was revised to 50 percent by the year 2030 so over here this is a correct statement this is also correct it is a psu of mnre which was incorporated in the year 2011 and is the primary implementing agency of mnre with regards to schemes or projects towards fulfillment of india's international commitments this is also a correct statement and our correct answer is d the next question is which of the following statements are true regarding the newly proposed fact check unit it will be established under the proposed digital india act its membership will include two experts one each from the fields of media and law the websites that do not agree to take down content in line with the order of the fcu will endanger their safe harbor immunity now what is this immunity if any information it is posted on a social media intermediaries platform that is facebook instagram twitter or so on by any individual or an organization then in case this information is fake or misleading or incriminating then this individual or organization will face the burnt of it and these social media intermediaries they will be immune against any such legal actions so we have taken this question because according to the newly amended it rules 2021 the government of india they are going to set up a fact check unit this fact check unit will be able to label content related to the government on the online platforms as fake or misleading 
the content that has been marked as such by the body will have to be taken down by the online intermediaries if they wish to retain their safe harbor that is the legal immunity they enjoy against the third party content the platforms will be required to prominently display when they take down any content on the basis of the unit's input so that this allows for an appeal process with the government committees so that the people who are affected because of this takedown they will have a respite apart from that the fcu will also have a website of its own where it will publish the links to the pieces of content that it has identified as fake or misleading according to the latest information the fcu it will have four members one of the members they will be a representative from the ministry of it second member from ministry of statistics and program implementation apart from that it will have two experts one from the field of media and the other one from the field of law so out of these statements this is incorrect we are not waiting for the digital india act this unit has already been proposed under the it rules of 2021 moreover its membership will include these two experts this is also a correct statement so a correct answer over here is b next question is how many of the following statements are true regarding the rare diseases these are the diseases that have no approved drugs available for their treatment all the rare diseases are of genetic origin india has a national policy for the treatment of rare diseases now rare disease is a health condition of low prevalence that affects a very small number of people compared to other prevalent diseases in the general population as of now there is no universally accepted definition of rare diseases every country they can define the rare diseases based on the number of people that get their disease compared to the rest of the population now globally it is estimated that around 6000 to 8000 rare diseases exist with new rare diseases being reported in the medical literature regularly however it is also identified that 80% of all rare disease patients they are affected by only 350 of these rare diseases now india also has a policy in place with regards to the rare diseases known as national policy for rare diseases 2021 to provide financial aid for the people who are suffering from these diseases a few examples of such diseases include hemophilia thalassemia sickle cell disease we also have gaucher disease which involves build up of fat laden cells in the spleen liver and bone marrow we have duchenne muscular dystrophy which causes progressive degeneration of the muscles we have cystic fibrosis some rare kinds of cancers and so on so that means that not all these rare diseases are genetic in nature the rare disease do include many genetic diseases but it also includes various rare cancers and infectious tropical diseases and degenerative diseases 80% yes they are of genetic in nature moreover around 95% of them they do not have any approved treatment while 5% they do have some sort of treatment available to either suppress or treat the disease but these are very expensive so over here this is a wrong statement some of these diseases do have drugs available for them this is also incorrect this however is correct so a correct answer over here is a the next question is select the correct statements regarding petroleum crude oil can be defined as sweet or sour depending upon its sulfur content sweet crude oil is easier to refine and transport Now you know that Russia has become the leading oil exporter to India. Now initially we were mainly getting the sar oil from the Ural area of Russia known as the high sulfur Urals. However, now 
India is demanding for sweeter oils from Russia because the sweet oils they are easier to refine, safer to extract, and easier to transport compared to the sour crude oil. Now, how do we define whether it is a sweet oil or a sour oil? It is defined on the basis of the sulfur content in the oil. So, if the oil it contains sulfur content less than 0.5%, then it is sweet oil. Any oil which has sulfur content more than 0.5% is known as a sour oil. Now, why this terminology related to tastes? Because the early prospectors, they used to taste the oil to determine its quality. And the low sulfur oil, it actually used to taste sweet while the high sulfur oil it used to taste sour. Now because sweet crude it is easier to refine, transport and extract that is why it commands a higher premium per barrel. So the per barrel cost of the sweet oil it is higher than that of the sour oil. The major locations where sweet crude can be found is the Appalachian Basin in USA, Western Texas, back in formation, North Sea of Europe, North Africa, Australia and Indonesia. Sar oil, it has more amount of sulfur and also more amount of carbon dioxide. So, sulfur, it is mostly present in it in the form of hydrogen sulfide. Now, most of you, you must have experienced this pungent smell coming out from the chemistry labs. So, this pungent smell, the rotten X smell was that of hydrogen sulfide. There is also a disease related to this sour oil known as the Gulf War Syndrome which is related to high levels of exposure to hydrogen sulfide from the sour oils. So, sour oil, it is mostly found in Gulf of Mexico, South America and Canada. So, out of these statements, this is correct, this is also correct and your correct answer is C. Next, we have a PYQ from the year 2018. Consider the following statements. Human capital formation as a concept is better explained in terms of a process which enables individuals of a country to accumulate more capital, increasing the knowledge, skill levels and capacities of the people of the country, accumulation of tangible wealth, accumulation of intangible wealth. Which of the statements given above is are correct? Now, how can you define human capital? Is this the capital that gets accumulated by the human beings? No. Human capital, it actually consists of the knowledge, skills and health that people invest in and accumulate throughout their lives, enabling them to realize their potential as productive members of the society. In fact, the OECD, they define the human capital as the knowledge, skills, competencies and other attributes embodied in individuals or group of individuals acquired during their life and used to produce goods, services or ideas in market circumstances. So, it is basically certain skills and knowledges that are accumulated to help the humans create economic capital. So, are they tangible or intangible? Tangible is a thing that is actually perceptible by touch. It can be touched. It is present in physical manner. So, these knowledge, skills and health, they are not present in physical manner. They are states of your mind. So, it actually helps in accumulation of not the tangible wealth, but the intangible wealth, which in turn can help you in achieving the tangible wealth or economic capital. So, over here, this is wrong, this is wrong. And these two are our correct answers. So, your correct option is option C. Now, we come to the fact of the day, which is about APPI and AHSSOH. So, what are these acronyms about? APPI is the Animal Pandemic Preparedness Initiative, while the AHSSOH, it is the Animal Health System Support for One Health. Since the year 2020, we have experienced one of the most devastating pandemic in human history. So, COVID mainly affected the human beings. Now, at the sidelines of this, there have been many pandemics that have been hitting the animal community as well. 
we have one of the worst infestations of bird flu that have hit the countries all across the world in india apart from that we have had the lumpy skin disease now in the comments tell us which states were mostly affected by this disease and which type of animal does this disease affect now both these initiatives they are under the national one health mission of the government of india and ahssoh is in fact being launched with the support of the world bank first let us talk about ahssoh now this is a project which aims to create an ecosystem for better animal health management systems using the one health approach it is an approach that unifies the management of the health of humans the ecosystems and the animals because all three of them they are very closely related with each other now the project this will be implemented in five states across 151 districts and it will help in improving the capacity building of the stakeholders involved in animal health and disease management there will be participation by human health forest and environment departments at national regional as well as the local levels for creating and strengthening this one health architecture including community engagement now across the 151 districts over which this project will work there will be a target to upgrade 75 district or regional laboratories upgrade or strengthen 300 veterinary hospitals and dispensaries and train 9000 para veterinarians diagnostic professionals and 5500 veterinary professionals apart from that there will be a massive awareness campaign on prevention of zoonotic diseases and pandemic preparedness at the community level by reaching out to almost 6 lakh households across these 151 districts now this project it will be implemented over a span of 5 years and this will be a central sector scheme apart from this one time training and upgradation approach this will also develop an ecosystem for continuous training of all the veterinarians and para veterinarians on innovative disease management practices and it will also help in creating a network of laboratories and integration of disease reporting system to increase the surveillance of the zoonotic and other animal diseases now let us talk about the animal pandemic preparedness initiative now this has been designed in order to increase our preparedness for any future animal related pandemics and epidemics now under this seven major activities have been proposed at different stages of execution first is defining a joint investigation and outbreak response team both at the national and state level second is designing an overall integrated disease surveillance system that will be built upon the national digital livestock mission The third one is strengthening of the regulatory systems related to these issues. Fourth is creating a disease modeling algorithm and early warning systems. Then strategizing disaster mitigation with National Disaster Management Authority. Initiate targeted research and development to develop various vaccines, diagnostic kits and therapies for the priority diseases. and seventh is building of genomic and environmental surveillance methods to improve the timelines and sensitivity of disease detection so at the different phases different activities will be undertaken so that we are very well prepared for any such future pandemic or epidemic so that was all about today's daily quiz i hope you were able to understand these concepts so do not forget to like the video share it and subscribe to our youtube channel for more such updates also tell us in the comments how many questions were you able to answer correctly thank you very much and have a very good day ahead